Hi, and welcome to this week's Truth Be Told. I'm Melissa Arrighi, the town manager and the host of this weekly show. If you ever have an issue that you would like to hear about, a topic, something in town that you would like me to address here on the show, please let me know. I'm really reachable, so you can get to me by email. You can call me and um, you can contact anyone on the fourth floor staff and they will let me know and I will get back to you. Today we have Jonathan Beter again. He's been on the show before. He's been on many shows. He's our DPW director for quite some time now. But we have a, somebody uh, from one of our divisions, crematory and cemetery. We have Ken King, the superintendent of the, that division. You don't see Ken very much and I'm delighted that he was willing to come on this show. I know that sometimes your first time on one of these shows can be a little bit uncomfortable. So I'm gonna try and make you, put you at ease as much as possible. I wanted to bring you on because cemeteries have been a conversation lately. Now, years ago, when we were first building the crematory, that was something that would come up. And we'll talk a little bit about the history of the crematory here in Plymouth. But first, I want to talk about our cemeteries because there's so many and they're so beautiful. So, Ken, I'm going to start with you. Can you just give us a little background about you? And then we can talk directly about some of the cemeteries you oversee. Okay. Um, as far as my background working with the town, I started working with the uh, police department in the summer of 89. Uh, I worked for them for two summers as a seasonal officer for the police department before getting on full time uh, in the cemeteries in 1990. Um, after that, I left and went to the parks division for uh, parks and forestry for about 22 years, then came back to the crematory and the cemetery about five years ago. And I've been here since. And you worked under Ted Bubbins for a long, long time, didn't you? I did for about 20, at least 22 years. And before that, Douglas Gray, um, who was before Ted. So, yeah. And the crematory cemetery, well, really, it was just the cemeteries. They were a division of, was it parks, trees? Ted was in charge of the parks, forest streets, uh, cemetery, and crematory. At one time, there was a, for many years, there was a cemetery superintendent and the position was vacated for a while, for about 16 years, um, and Ted took over that role. And then at that time, um, you know, during that time, he also had the crematory built and was in charge of that also. I think one of the best things that we did, though, was to separate out those divisions because cemetery crematory is an area that, one, I don't think it gets um, enough attention publicly because we, we need to make sure as long as we can get, uh, provide the public with a lot of information about our crematory cemetery, that's how we get the financial support to do all the work you need to do. And one of the areas you're struggling with is staffing, is that correct? Uh, well, since I've been here 31 years, uh, staffing at the cemeteries has never been appropriate. Um, it's, uh, we have a huge turnover with health because I think it's a very difficult job. Um, they go to other departments um, where it, they have staffing that's, you know, um, I would say more adequate, um, where here it's, it's a very difficult place to take care of. When we take care of so many places, they really never can get caught up on anything. So uh, the staffing levels needs to be increased. It always has. We, we just take care of too many places. Um, we have burials that happen. Um, we can have three burials at three separate locations all at the same time. So when you average of four employees, um, it's, it's just not workable. It never And happens. you, you and JB, you're coming to this fall town meeting to request, I think it was an additional five staff members. And you think that would be the boost you need to help care for these, was it 33 cemeteries? Well, a lot of the cemeteries are listed, you know, they're on private property, but we, you know, uh, we have to basically take care of any veteran that's buried within the town's limits. The cemetery. So we just can't basically go and take care of one veteran's grave. We have to take care of the whole cemetery. So um, we have, we usually take care of about 22 cemeteries, 23 cemeteries uh, before Memorial Day each year. We go in a couple times a year and clean those outside cemeteries. The largest cemetery, Vine Hills in Oak Grove, um, it's 40 some odd acres, but we also take care of Chiltonville Cemetery, Manomet, and Burial Hill, and uh, Burial Hill is very difficult to maintain um, as far as cutting the grass. Um, but it's, the, the biggest issue is how many areas we take care of and how spread out throughout town they are. Um, where the smaller cemeteries really don't get a, a lot of work done to them each year. 
Right. So those are the minimal, uh, the minimum amount of maintenance in a place like, so we recently have been talking about the Manomet Cemetery because access to the cemetery was actually through someone's driveway. Do I have that correct? No, no, that was the White Horse Cemetery off of Cedar White Road. Horse. Right. So um, it's another property we really don't own. Um, it was, uh, you know, nobody could find out that information because it's such an old cemetery. I believe it's the second oldest cemetery in Plymouth. Um, so we do have access on the opposite side that it's town land, but it's too steep of a grade to get any kind of equipment up there. We just wouldn't be able to get up there. So for years, we've had access going through someone's driveway, which is private property. And a lot of the places that we take care of, we have access issues um, and we do the best we can. But in the end, if, if someone doesn't want us on their property, we really don't have a right to do that. I'll tell you what, that would be an interesting legal debate or to look at what the outcome would be because if there is i believe you said there is a mass general law on the books that requires that a community maintain a veteran's grave site right. and if that is the case but the only way that we can adequately access the veteran's grave site is through private property and they decline to allow us to do that and certainly we're not going to go anywhere with equipment that is not safe for our men and women to get to um, and i'm glad that hasn't happened in plymouth uh, I'd like to talk a little bit to because we visited, we were at Vine Hills the other day. Uh, JB, thank you for meeting me on site there. We had a woman who was um, concerned because her daughter's grave, somebody had run over a spigot so that she was not able to access water right there. However, there were spigots. It'd be, what would you say on either side, about 500 feet? Say about 50 feet, 60 feet. Oh, yeah, 50 they, were, feet. they were very close in proximity. So one of the things that JB and I have started to talk about in our broader conversations about the environment and water conservation and some of the stricter guidelines that are coming down from the state and DEP and even our own local environmental groups that want us to try and reduce and conserve our water consumption, we started to talk about where can we do that in one subject, and it will be a very sensitive subject, I understand, one subject that came up is at the cemeteries because there are a lot of spigots and they get older. JB, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so first, thank you, Melissa, for having Kenny and I. This is just the first of a series of DPW. So everybody's gonna see us as we throw, roll through all the DPW divisions. But you and Kenny touched on a lot of things, you know, all great, you know, cemeteries, crematory is a great service for the town. You know, I, I will say that the maintenance and I hope everybody sees the improvement over the past couple of years in terms of maintenance of the cemeteries. The crematory, Kenny does a fantastic job. It's a great service. Our numbers have really started to spike in terms of how many cremations we do a year. So we're keeping up with all of these things. But but again, it's it's the service we provide. But as Melissa just mentioned, you know, we are trying to conserve water. A lot of the the, the water services, the systems within the cemeteries are old and aging, and we have a lot of leaks. So we're looking at those collectively through all the cemeteries in terms of how do we fix the, and address the issue. One way to do that is to have more of a centralized location for, for residents to obtain water for the grave sites. But again, that's something we're gonna look at and it's gonna take some, some time for us because yes, we do have leaks and there's a cost associated with that. We can't have these spigots thrown throughout the cemeteries as we do today. So that's something we're gonna look at. But again, overall, um, you know, we're very pleased with the, the split, Melissa, in terms of breaking up parks and forestry from the cemetery and the crematory. That was a, that was so needed in terms of providing an increase in service. And I think we've had a lot of good results because of that. But yeah, I think, you know, we're going to continue to look at the cemeteries in terms of way to, ways to conserve water and, and help the residents, you know, address the needs of, 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 of the dead. And there will be a learning curve, because certainly when we were there, we saw some elderly people, and I've stopped down there and spoken to some of them, and it is a little difficult for them to bring some kind of water container, fill it up at the spigot, and then bring it over to their loved one's grave site. I actually helped somebody when I was down there. I love to plant. I've said that on the show before. I'm a big flower person. So I said, I can help you plant that don't require that amount of water that maybe some of the things that are there now do. And... And Ken, while I was at that cemetery, which is absolutely beautiful, I noticed that there are a lot of people who have place items all around their graves, either personal to them or personal to their loved one. But I was watching one of your staff try to maneuver through that area. Tell me a little bit about the rules that we have in place.
ways and that we that we try to enforce, but we're obviously very sensitive to to the people that are grieving in that area. Well, I'm, you know, honestly, we're we don't want anyone to place anything in front of their stone more than 12 inches. Um, it just ends up being an issue with the amount of time it takes to weed whack around. So, you know, when you go from a three foot uh, wide headstone to something that's eight or nine feet in diameter because it's a raised bed, uh, the employees have a really hard time getting their mowers over items, around items. They have to turn around. It's a, it's a waste of time. Um, you know, we know it has to be, you know, a personal, you know, uh, items that they, you know, care for and they, they lost a loved one, but it, it literally takes away from all the other places that we take care of. So the policies were really never followed. Um, in the last two years, we probably removed over 400 shrubs. Uh, some of the shrubs are lifting up the headstones and they're falling down. Um, so then, um, so we've been removing them um, because you can't even see the people's, their headstones. You can't see the names. And on a lot of the older sections where we don't have a lot of information, um, a headstone is, it, it's, it's your, it, you really need to see that name when you start looking for people's plots. Um, and they're just overgrown. They should have never been placed there. And then the guys, the, the, the leaves get caught up underneath them. Uh, it's just one more thing to go around with the mowers. And unfortunately, a lot of these items, because these policies were never followed, they're being placed on other people's lots. They're overgrowing onto people's lots. They're going in back of their headstone, which you're not allowed to have anything behind your headstone. And so that's become an issue when people plant trees and shrubs on someone else's plot, it puts us in the middle of, uh, you know, a heated argument. And, and that's such a tough position to be in. And I understand that. One of the first questions somebody might be saying if they're at home right now as they watch the show is, well, why weren't the policies enforced? And, and I think I want to answer that because when people are out there and they're grieving and they're doing these plantings and they're putting teddy bears on the site and they're putting, I saw a lot of those, you know, little solar lights and they're putting a lot of that around and you don't necessarily know as a staff person when they might be coming back. So sometimes they might not come back for a year and by then the things are, you know, ruined or decrepit. And it's also when you are telling people to remove things, there can be, you know, when someone is grieving, I think we all have experienced it. There can be some real strong pushback and emotions that happen. So I am hoping that with this new cemetery committee that Selectman Quintel wanted to put together that one of the broader subject matters that they can look at is not just um, maintenance, but maybe how we enforce these rules. Now it's going to be a shock, I think, for some people if we do indeed start to do that. So it's going to, going to have to be something that we phase in or ease in when we start maybe clearing out. Because correct me if I'm wrong, but there are cemeteries in Duxbury and down the Cape that allow nothing but the headstone. You are correct. And they're beautiful. I, they're beautiful. They're much easier to maintain. And I do believe that there are so many wonderful things that can be done with headstones nowadays that they can really be personalized. Um, JB, to jump back to water one more minute, because um, that too would be a major change for the cemetery, but it certainly would help with maintenance. But would it, JB, would it hurt us when it comes to maintaining all the obviously the grass, the lawns, and, and everything else that we need the water for when we're out on site? No, that wouldn't, that wouldn't have an impact on us whatsoever because we don't, we don't irrigate the cemeteries. Okay. Now, but go ahead. I do, before, before we wrap up, I do have two pieces. One is, you know, we're going to town meeting for an easement for Cedarville, and I think this is an awesome platform for Kenny and I to talk about that real quick for, for your town meeting reps and just the views in general. Where you brought up the access issue with Manaman, we do have an access issue with the Cedarville Cemetery. So we're moving forward with town meeting. We have finance committee this evening, um, selectmen, and then town meeting on the 16th, where we're looking to acquire an access easement to one of the abutters, uh, which all that has been worked out and detailed. And again, we're going to town meeting October 16th on the Saturday, and hopefully town meeting will support that request because for the Cedarville Cemetery, we have no legal access. So that's something we're asking for everybody's support on, and we can get into those details as we go through all the different meetings, okay? You know what, JB, that was smart to bring that up because this show will air at a perfect time. So let's jump right back into town meeting. So one of the things I'm super proud of in Plymouth, and I'm happy I was the town manager when I came around to it, is that we need to concentrate more 
on, you know, I call it a little bit back to the basics, but we need to concentrate more on the public access at, don't let me swear on this show, assets, all the facilities, grounds, parks, equipment that Plymouth taxpayers own. And one of those is the cemetery. So I was thrilled that Ken and you for this fall town meeting, not only asking for staffing and not only are looking for things like easements to have better access to the cemeteries, but you're also looking for equipment. And as I recall, I was working on the Capitol list yesterday. Ken, you had two or three pieces of important pieces of equipment that you need. Let's talk about those and see if we can get some buy-in from the viewers to help us with that. All right. Um, well, basically, if, you know, if we do acquire new staff, we're going to need new equipment, uh, new trucks. Um, what I've been trying to do is to have uh, equipment that we always have a backup in case something goes down. We are giving very little time for burials. So if our equipment went down, um, some of our equipment is unique. It's very small. Um, it's hard to rent. Um, so I'm always trying to find a way that doesn't put us in a position of not being able to do our job, that being trailers, which I've doubled up on the trailers. Um, but we only, the town only has one mini excavator to dig the graves in the town. If it ever went down, we would have to rent one. If one was available, well, if I don't have the time in between that time to find one, I'm going to be in trouble. Um, mm -hmm. We can always backfill a grave with a mini excavator. Um, and we can always, you know, that's what we use to dig. Um, we also have a skid steer that we use for the backfills also. So I'm trying to get enough equipment that in case anything was to happen, I always have a backup. Tell me about the utility cart. The utility buggies are uh, basically small little dump trucks that we use to haul the dirt away from the grave sites. Um, so every grave that we dig, we usually dig, um, load it up about eight times and that fill is uh, brought off site and dumped and then of course when we do the backfill it's loaded again and bring into the brought to the site before we used to leave large piles of dirt right next to the grave and it was unsightly uh, utility carts have uh, enabled us to make it more uh, a, a better experience instead of seeing a large hump of dirt right next to a barrel and of course it's not safe to have a lot of weight right next to an open hole um, so they're used a lot to bring around staff uh, and get into tight spots around the cemetery instead of using trucks. Um, we use them to haul around um, foundations, uh, the concrete for the foundations, the veteran stones, any, any place where we need to get into a tight spot. So um, the, I'm trying to have three of them in total with one of our units being 15 years old, it is very tired. It's at the end of its life cycle. Um, a year ago, I replaced, I purchased a new one um, and that's helped out because a lot of times when we have graves at the end of the day, um, staff was trying to get home and we'll have uh, burials uh, at 1.30 in the afternoon. And if the funeral was running late and family was uh, you know, around uh, longer than normal, um, we're in a rush to get that grave back filled when everyone leaves. And so the two utility cars would help. Um, during the time I was asking for my second one, um, when I came back from one of my meetings, it, uh, our only unit had broken, broken down right in the middle of a roadway and lost its power steering. Um, we, we just didn't have a backup at that time. And I'm glad we did get the, the new unit, but I'm looking for another unit. So, You know what? I think we're going to get a lot of support at this town meeting. I think that if all of us keep working with the philosophy of we need to improve and maintain and keep up on the taxpayers' assets, I think that will really help. JB, I want to talk about a little bit uh, before the show ends about the crematory. Now, in my naivete, I thought that cremations were really the way of the future. I thought it was the way people were going is land is so precious and it's hard to develop more cemeteries. But in Plymouth, we do have some land set aside that we could potentially do that. And I have heard, and I have not confirmed this, that there is a law that requires that every community be able to and put people to rest or bury people or intern people. But wouldn't a cremation suffice for that? Or do you have to actually build more cemetery land? Yeah, so it's a little bit of both, Melissa. And again, you had mentioned the cemetery committee earlier, and I just want to follow up on that because that's an important element because the select board has appointed a cemetery committee that Kenny and I are working with. They're looking at, you know, service levels. They're looking at fees. They're looking at, you know, the regulations. But more importantly, they're, they're looking at, you know, additional space, you know, i.e. parting ways is the site we're looking at, 
cremation. So all of those things we're looking at and how do we comply with the law and where is Plymouth going to be three, five, 10, 20, 50 years out. So yes, those are the things we're looking at and we pl do plan on coming back to the select board in your office to update everybody. But yeah, there is a, there, you know, we do have to comply with the law in terms of providing that burial space, whether we do it with just cremations or, you know, acquiring, you know, cemetery land, that's something we're looking at. But you did ask Kenny a question in terms of capital and town meeting. I just want to touch on that real quick because we really didn't get into that. And that's super important for us. Yes, we are requesting, you know, five new positions for Kenny. Kenny, uh, the, cemetery, the, the cemetery has five seasonal employees. Every year we struggle with, you know, acquiring that help. Usually we only have two. So that really sets us back. Looking to do away with the seasonals and hire just laborers year round, that would put us in a much better situation. So what Kenny did was he put in a capital request for two new trucks, a utility cart, and a mini excavator. So those are the requests to support those additional staffing. But as Kenny mentioned, maneuverability is very difficult in the cemeteries and we have to comply with OSHA law. And so we need this new equipment to, to address those needs. So Kenny's been doing a fantastic job with that. Uh, that's the only reason why we're going to fall town meeting. Usually we go to spring for those capital type items. But given what's happening with the cemetery committee recommendations, staffing requests, and just general need, we're asking for those items. So that's really what's kind of going on right now. But yeah, the crematory is a, is a, is a, is a very unique operation for a public works for a town. We're one of a few that has one. So I think everything we do is a little bit different. And, and I think as long as we're looking towards the future and we're creative, we're going to do a great job. Ken, as you look at the crematory, because I think it's just a beautiful facility. Um, and when we first did the ribbon cutting for that, I remember um, thinking that the viewing room was discreet, just nicely done. Is it used a lot? It is not. Um, hmm. Maybe about four times a year. I mean, during COVID, of course, we had closed it down to any viewings. Um, but no, unfortunately, it's not. No, it's not unfortunate. I mean, I think there are other things that we can do with the space. I'm, I'm thinking that obviously when we designed the building and worked with the architect, that was something that as we were moving more and more towards cremations, that people thought that the families and loved ones would want to be able to, to, to view that. And actually that is not the case. So I think that there is absolutely a way to repurpose that, that room if that's something we decide to do in the future. I don't think it takes away from the facility at all. About how many cremations are we doing a year in Plymouth? Uh, this year we're on track to probably do over 1,300. So, um, you know, back in 2016, we went down to about 700. So we're almost double since 2016. I mean, more people are choosing cremation. The average, the national average is usually around 2%. We're doing a little bit more than that. And here in Plymouth, um, the amount of burials that we do, um, cremation burials is uh, surpassed full burials. Um, so we're very busy with cremation burials because more people are choosing it. Ken, when you just said that stat to me, would you know, and I don't mean to, I mean, I have to put you on the spot, I guess, but how many um, traditional burials do you think we will do this year? Uh, right now, we're at 54 burials and 64 cremate burials. So um, usually we're, our total is about 140 combined, give or take, depending on you know, the year. Right, right. Well, Thank you so much, you and uh, you and JB, for being to being willing to work with this cemetery committee. I don't know if we've had one in the past. I don't recall having one here, and I do think they might be able to be a great source for us when it comes to residents and buy-in on some of the changes we know that we need to make that are going to be tough ones, and tough ones for people to buy in that have been going there a long time. Because you have some regular visitors down in many of the cemeteries that are there every single day or at least twice a week. We do. Um, you have, you said three, how many full-time staff right now? How many full-time staff in the crematory? In the crematory, we have a full-time cremationist. We have a part-time cremationist that we just brought back, which was a lot of help to us. Um, I wish he was here during COVID because we, our numbers um, exploded during COVID. Um, they went from an average of 17 a week to, at times, more than double that, over 40 a week. So it was a challenge with, um, you know, between myself and the cremationist uh, not getting COVID and not closing operations. Um, so there was only one person at a time in the building. Um, and there was a lot of 10 and 12 hour days and we're working Saturdays to keep up. Um, mm. So it's, we've been very busy. 
Well, both of you, I think that's about the time we have for today. Um, the one thing I would like JB for you to mention before we go is I receive calls as well as the select board members about tours of Burial Hill. And this too is an issue that can be difficult because we certainly don't want people in there after dusk. We don't want, you know, Burial Hill is an area that it's so historic and we have to be so careful that things aren't broken or destroyed. JP, how do, how do you and Ken balance that, those requests and permissions to do these tours of Burial Hill? Yeah, it, there's, there's a number of tours. I know they do the ghost tours. I know they were doing actually restorations and stores, you know, the Friends of the Stones, Friends of Burial Hill, great group. And we've worked with them for, for a number of years. But during COVID, it's been difficult because they've been asking to do their tours and we've been kind of been shutting them down. Uh, I have not received a request anytime soon. Have you, Kenny? Is any, t any recent requests for tours yeah, or access? Been, yeah, and I've changed the time frame that they go up there because they're trying to go up there too late. So I've reduced that it, depending on what time they have. Um, it's getting darker earlier now. And so I, I've asked them to uh, change their time frames that they're going up there. Yeah, and, and just to follow up with that too, if, if anybody hasn't been up there recently, you know, um, the, the cemetery crews have done a phenomenal job with the walkways. They've reset a lot of the brick out towards the back. Uh, we're working with an architect now to, to rehab the hearse house. Mm -hmm. you know, new roof, new window. So that's happening. You know, Kenny's working on the railing. So we're going to be putting out another bid for stone restoration. So when you look at Burial Hill as a whole, I mean, great job, Kenny. Great job. It's all coming along nicely. Well, great job to the two of you for being on the show today. JB, I love that it's the DPW month or six weeks or however, Absolutely. Many, however long we're doing. And thank you to the viewers for tuning in to Truth Be Told. Um, we'll have another great show for you next week, and we look forward to seeing you then. Take care. Bye, guys. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.